Well, thank you very much for having me. And it is a special pleasure to be sponsored by the physicians and pharmacologists, uh, Palestinian physicians and pharmacologists in uh, Germany. I met several <coughs> Palestinian dentists uh, before the program this evening. And we had very productive discussions about root canals, <laughs> a subject that's very close to my heart. <laughs> it's also very close to my gums. <laughs> At this point, I think I have more root canals than there are canals in Venice. So. I had some expert advice on how to proceed. Uh, I'll be speaking this evening on the most recent developments in the Israel-Palestine and also the Israel-Lebanon conflict. I'll start with what happened in Gaza in 2008, then look at what happened on the Mavi Marmara, the Freedom Flotilla, at the end of May of this past year, and then look to where things are headed. Now, I do know from past experience and following the subject in Germany that it's very difficult to have a rational discussion on this topic in Germany. And so I hope that we can set an example here this evening of trying to have a reasonable discussion of what's going on there and always bearing in mind that our goal is to try to reach a settlement of the conflict which respects the humanity of all parties to the conflict. I don't usually, when I speak, I don't usually speculate on where things are going. I prefer to just look at the documentary record, the factual record, and to clarify exactly what's happened. But I feel duty bound in recent weeks to speak about what the future holds, because it does seem to me there are some very ominous developments now unfolding before our eyes and that the likely target of a new war has already been determined, that target being Lebanon, and that there seems to be a kind of concerted action. I'll manage it. There seems to be a kind of concerted action by the Western powers now acting in coordination. I don't think. No, no, don't worry. There does seem to be a coordinated effort now by the Western powers using the United Nations Security Council in order to soften up the target, weaken the target, by creating discord and tensions and frictions inside Lebanon, and then to pave the way at the end for an Israeli assault on Lebanon. I'll speak about that in greater detail later on, let me now begin with the uh, review of the most recent developments. I'm going to begin with Gaza, but the story actually begins, if time allowed me, the story actually begins in May 2000, when the Israeli occupying army was evicted from Lebanon, from the south of Lebanon, after a 17-year-long guerrilla war. Uh, Israel was forced to retreat, 
but it was determined to undo the defeat that it suffered in Lebanon. And so already from 2001, already from 2001, Israel was preparing for the next attack on Lebanon in order to inflict a defeat on the party of God, on Hezbollah. The Israelis waited patiently for a pretext, for an excuse, and that pretext came in the summer of 2006, when Israel went in again and wreaked the death and destruction on Lebanon, but was unable to inflict a military defeat on the Hezbollah. Well, now Israel had suffered two successive defeats against the Hezbollah, and the Israelis began to worry that their deterrence capacity was now being undermined. Deterrence capacity is a fancy term. I'm not even sure how the translator will uh, put it in German. But all it means is the Arab fear of Israel. And Israel was very worried that the Arabs were no longer fearing it, especially, especially because the Secretary General of the Hezbollah, Mr. Nasrallah, he kept saying and taunting the Israelis, we're no longer afraid of you. We're no longer afraid of your army. If you want to invade us, invade us again, and you'll be defeated. Well, now Israel had to figure out how to restore its deterrence capacity, how to restore the Arab Muslim world's fear of it. They couldn't do so at that point in Lebanon because they weren't certain they could prevail against the Hezbollah. And so they chose Gaza, Gaza being Israel's favorite shooting gallery. And they went into Gaza not because of anything the people or the leadership of Gaza had done, but as the Israelis were very honest about, they said the assault on Gaza had nothing to do with Gaza. It had everything to do with Lebanon, with trying to restore Israel's deterrence capacity by going into Gaza and inflicting mass death and destruction on the people and the society there. The story basically begins, the background to Gaza, it basically begins in January 2006 when there were parliamentary elections among the Palestinians in the occupied territories. Unexpectedly, Hamas, the Islamic movement, came out the victor. Jimmy Carter, the former U.S. president, who was an observer at these elections, Mr. Carter said the elections were completely honest and fair. The immediate reaction of the United States and Israel to these completely honest and fair elections were to impose economic sanctions on the people of Gaza to punish them for having elected the wrong party into power. About a year and a half later, the United States and Israel grew impatient with the fact that Hamas was still in power. And so they engineered, they plotted a coup to overthrow the legally elected government. They worked with some elements among the Palestinian Authority. The coup failed. The Palestinian elements retreated to the West Bank. And now Israel and the United States 
they tightened the blockade of Gaza. <coughs> Amnesty International called the blockade of Gaza a flagrant violation of international law. The Goldstone Mission, which was commissioned by the Human Rights Council and headed up by Richard Goldstone, the distinguished jurist from South Africa, who also happens to be Jewish, and who also, by his own understanding, he says, I am a Zionist. And Mr. Goldstone concluded in his report, he said that the blockade of Gaza has been a possible crime against humanity. During this period, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, she journeyed to Gaza. And she said, Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed. I'm not exaggerating. Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed. In June 2008, a ceasefire was negotiated by Egypt between Israel and the Palestinians and Hamas. Each side had obligations under the ceasefire. The Palestinians, Hamas, they had to stop their rocket and mortar attacks on Israel. And Israel, it had to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. The blockade, which is a flagrant violation of international law. The blockade, which was destroying the civilization. Now, according to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it said, and I'm quoting it now, Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. But Israel refused to lift the blockade of Gaza. Israel violated its obligation under the ceasefire negotiated by Egypt. What happened next? What happened next is not controversial. It's not in dispute. All you have to do is open up Amnesty International's yearbook for 2009. And here's what Amnesty has to say. A ceasefire agreed in June between Israel and Palestinian armed groups in Gaza. It held for four and a half months. But it broke down after Israeli forces killed six Palestinian militants in airstrikes and other attacks on 4 November 2008. Israel began planning for the invasion of Gaza at least as early as March 2007. When all the pieces were in place, they ne then needed a pretext. They needed an excuse. And so they patiently waited until November 4th, the election day in the United States, when they knew that the media and the public, its attention would be focused on the outcome of the historic election. And on that date, they invade Gaza, <laughs> killed six Palestinian militants, knowing that by killing those militants, it would provoke Hamas to resume the rocket and mortar attacks. But not only knowing that it would provoke Hamas, wanting to provoke Hamas, so they would have the pretext the excuse to unleash the long-planned invasion. But you know those Islamists, those Muslims, they're crazy, they're stubborn, they're 